one of the most brilliant people that we have had come out of this medical school walked into it with a 23. And this year made the highest score on the certifying exam for neurosurgery. He missed one question mark and scored in the 99th percentile on every standardized test. 23 teacher. on the MCAT. 23, 23 on the MCAT. Neurosurgery. Neurosurgery. Highest score. Highest score. And more house. house. Bad brother. Bad brother. And so, so it goes, again, the fact so, that you have to do that, right. but we have to do it. And Cedric and me and people like us, that's the work we do on our side every day to make sure that the students are out there wondering, well, I got a 3,000, do you think I really should apply to UNC? Or I got a 2A, should I apply to UNC? Well, you got a 2A and you work 30 hours a week because you had to, to get through. You took the time to go to MED or to SMDP in the summer. You found someone to work in a research lab and you didn't forget where you came from, you can go to medical school. So you are going to look at that applicant. Absolutely. Right? And, and just to answer the original question, yes, we do have cutoffs that we have just for our original screening. Mm -hmm. But my role is to go beyond the cutoff mm -hmm. and to look at applications and to find those pearls, those gems, yep. those diamonds in the room. And, and they are there. And I'm, I'm, and, and it's my job to advocate for them at our admissions committee. <clears throat> and that's what I do. Uh, and our, our admissions committee, it, I must admit, they're getting it because they're beginning to argue with me less. And some of them are actually beginning to make the argument for me. So I don't have to make that argument. Uh, but, you know, it, it's very crucial, that, you know, that we understand that, you know, in life, they're always cut offs. People don't lose basketball games. They ran out of time. But everyone knows the clock is going in. That's right. Right? That's right. Which, which determines the winner and the loser. Yeah. Same thing with cut offs. Yes, they're arbitrary cut offs. But people like us are here to go beyond the cut off and to find those other people. So we say apply. Now, we might not always be successful at getting you through the first time. You may have to come back and apply again, and we, we may have a better opportunity when you've done some other things to help improve your application. But the most important thing is never let a dream deferred become a dream denied. Too many people say, I don't get through on the first time, and they quit. Too many people say, this is too hard, and they quit. The fact of the matter is, you have to see it through. This is something that if you want this profession, this is not a put your coffee down, put in some coffee, pour in some water, bam, I got coffee. This is percolator work. <laughs> well, you got to, and I don't even know what percolator <laughs> is. But, you know, when your coffee has to actually be ground and then go into a separate holding area where the water comes in, and then percolates over that coffee and makes that pot, and then you got to take the pot and pour it into your cup. Okay? It's a process. It's what? And we can't be afraid of the process. <coughs> we have to be able to embrace the process and embrace the challenge. Because when you're able to do that, no matter what obstacle people throw at you, you will always be able to overcome. And that's what's going to happen to you when you get to a residency program. That's what's going to happen to you when you come out for your first job. That's what's going to happen to you that yeah, first right. night on call. All of these things are going to be, these challenges are always going to occur. But if you're able to do things methodically and in a process, you will always be able to overcome those obstacles. So all this sounds, you know, lovely. But so the question, so, so myth or not myth? Whenever I submit my application with that beautiful personal statement that tells you who I am, and tells mm -hmm. you how hard I worked, my personal statement is not even going to get read. It's going to get skimmed over. You know, it's going to be in a big stack. Like we told you before, there are going to be a group of schools who are going to look at numbers first. And 
you know, it's easy. The students know. Let me let me just say to you that the people that you're trying to reach know. There's a culture in uh, even just among the undergraduate schools, and they have resources. They have pre-help advisors. So someone who comes to me and says, "Well, I didn't know. I'm not believing that because I know the pre-help advisors." And they, they not, it, it makes them look bad if they tell people to apply to this school when they know that they don't have a chance. Because at the end of the end of the year, there's going to be an accounting of their effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And students now have many more resources than we ever had. They have student.net. They have their pre-health advisors. They have all kinds of blogs and stuff. You know, they get advice from their summer programs. So failure to take advantage of those things is not an excuse for an inappropriate application. So if you know that everything that you've read says this school is looking for numbers and you don't have the numbers, why would you waste your application fee on that school? Why? Because your ego wants you to do it, ego is cost. And at the end of the day, it's about getting to medical school. And it's about getting the training and being able to do something with an MD. So it's that old thing of pride goes before the fall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If your pride is so good that you think that I can only apply to this tier of school, when you know that the reality says, you know, I'm probably not competitive based on what I know. Not because you aren't competitive, but for what that school is looking, is looking for, you're not it. Why would you bang your head against the wall? And then, you really, and then to come back on that, we're going to read the personal statement. The personal statement is going to be read. Because that's part, if you get past the initial criteria, we're going to read the personal statement. So, really, it's important that you have a good personal statement. Um, so, yes, they, yeah, they will get, they will, they will get ready. If you're going, if your application starts going through the process, it will be ready. Yeah. So, and there, there are some schools that will choose to send or invite students to do a secondary application after they have that initial screen of what comes through on the AMCAS, and that's their prerogative. Mm -hmm. that, that absolutely is their prerogative. And it's not my job or Cedric's job to pass judgment on them. That's just the way it is. Right. But and I would say that the overwhelming majority of schools now have just gone to um, sending an invitation to the secondary, to the students. And the students can choose. Well, this is a group of student schools that I think I'm competitive for. Well, this is a group of schools that meet what my desires are. But you got to know what those desires are. Yeah. You know, this is an intentional process. Mm -hmm. It is not, oh, this happenstance. It's, it's an intentional process. And then, it, you know, this business about dreams and having dreams is important. And I'm, I'm on my bulletin the board, there's... It's saying from Benjamin May, who was from the president of one house. And one of the pieces is about dreams. It's not about having your dream not happen. It's about having no dreams. And too many of us, our, our children, are coming to this with no dreams. They haven't thought about who do I want to be in 10 years. Where do I want to be? What is it that I want to do? How do I want to leave the world better than I found it? Right. And when you're in college, that's the time to start looking for that. You can't wait until you finish college to say, okay, now I need to go figure this out. That's why you got a freebie for four years to find out. Mm -hmm. And in medical school, we have the job of protecting the most precious of the gifts that you're given, that you're born with, as your health. Mm -hmm. And so it's our job to match the protectors of that gift. 
with people who have the right quality, the ability to think logically, to do science, and the overwhelming and absolute requirement to never disrespect and never take away the dignity of another person. So when you get the two of those in any stage of development, you can run with it. It's when one or the other or both are missing. And the take on message to your viewers should be that those two have to coexist. They have to coexist. Let me ask. So we'll, we'll start moving towards a wrap up, but before we get to the wrap up, I'm trying to make sure we hit all the big kind of categories. So, kind of summarizing um, GPA, MCAT, don't let that hold you back from applying. Um, on a timeline, submit your application early. When, do, when is early? When, you know, when does the, M, the MCAT open? As early as you can. As early as you can. MCAT's open. Yeah. Just the way. But usually in early to mid June. Okay. Right. And then, let me say something about deadlines. Okay. I got something in June. The application is available for the May. So, most people's deadlines start dropping in around mid September, first of October, for AMCAS. So, if you know that a school has a deadline of October 1st, do not Submit September 30th. Don't. No. And then if. Because it takes two weeks for AMCAS to process it to then tell the school is ready. That's right. So if you, if their deadline, like for instance, that due, our AMCAS deadline is October 1st. So it's got to hit AMCAS at September 15th. And AMCAS. Or you don't look at it at all. No, it just doesn't get to us. It doesn't doesn't show up. It doesn't show up. Yeah. Because the deadline is when they lock, they will not process it. Anybody else? And, yeah. I mean, they won't process it. So they're saying to people now, to because the number of applications is going up because the new schools coming online, that you need to get get in there as soon as you can. And then there's a secondary application deadline that's after that that's school specific. It drives me nuts. You've had until June, you've had since May the 1st, and it's now November 1st, and on October 31st, you're calling asking me for an extension? Oh, no. Do you do that with your house, your rent, or your house note? No. You don't want to be evicted. Do you do that with anything else that is important? It's, what is it? Five, um, eleven, six months to get it done. And so people don't understand there's something as simple as that. It te- it's a, we make bad judgments on that. We, maturity. 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 You know, oh, you will. You need to get a test done. Oh, no. We, yeah. you know, we look at the date of submission of the application. Didn't know that, did you? <laughs> I have a big brother who ended that. But, but, but most people don't know that. They don't. Yeah. Local yeah. schools look at that. Yeah, we do. We do. Um, there was something that you said that I wanted to come back to. Uh, what, what was the original question? Um, dates to dates submit. To submit. Dates to submit. Oh, man. I'm about to come back to that call. Oh, oh, yes, 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 yes. So if you find yourself in a position where, you know, you wanted to apply, but now the deadline has gone by, <laughs> understand you're not dead, but you're not gonna make it that year. No. The thing that I the, the thing that I see students doing that I don't like is I see them rushing to get the medical school. I see them saying, you know, I gotta apply this year, I gotta apply this year, I gotta take the MCAT now. I got it, 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 I got it. There's all this urgency. Medical school is not going anywhere, folks. Yeah. It's going to be there. That's a benefit for being older anyway. Exactly. Another year of seasoning makes you a better student. So, you know, when I see folks rushing, 
In a sense, it kind of gives me an idea of where they are maturity-wise. Because if somebody realizes that they can't make a deadline, a mature decision is, I can't make a deadline, let me prepare myself for the next day. And you move on. You don't try to change the system or change, you know, what everybody else is, the, the, the rules for the game that everybody else was able to play by. Okay? So that to me is, is another crucial thing, folks. If you, if you, you know, if, if, you know, you have your goals, you have your dreams, you have your ideal timeline, sometimes your timeline and God's timeline for you don't match. And when that happens, be mature enough to understand that that, that just wasn't the time. You know what God's talking about. Um, other, other thing I realized I forgot to get to, and um, we actually did a short video on this, on that verse medicine recently, was um, osteopathic skills. Um, in terms of getting into residency, in terms of... Well, we didn't even speak about that, because that's another component of why there are less GME slots, because there are more osteopaths yeah, that are coming and doing, taking, taking our, um, or deciding to go down the allopathic pathway, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to going down the homeopathic pathway, mm -hmm. which is what uh, osteopaths do. Um, but that being stated, you know, Sometimes their requirements are a little less rigorous as it relates to the MCAT number. Um, and I, and students that finish with a DO are still called doctor. So uh, in some aspects, for some so some of my students that have tried and have tried and have tried and were not successful at getting into a medical school, DO school becomes a viable alternative. And then, then there's still other things, too. You know, there's PA school. There's nurse practitioner school. There's physical therapy, occupational therapy. Just because you don't end up becoming a medical doctor doesn't mean that your ability to be a contributing citizen in the health in a health career is over. You know, so there are other avenues in which you could take that you could channel your dream and still come out and do patient care. So we're running short on, I was going to get into research, but we're running kind of short on time. So um, last couple of minutes, let's say, we'll start with Dr. Actually, no, we'll start with Dr. Bright, because Dr. Armstrong is technically our guest because of black man, white <laughs> coat. So, you know, she's our guest in it. So we'll start with Dr. Bright, and we'll give Dr. Armstrong the last word. Um, two minutes, you know, what you would tell the pre-meds, diverse medicine listeners who are getting ready to apply to med school or who are in that process of what two minutes most important thing. Well, uh, Dale, uh, what I would say uh, is kind of what I've already stated. You know, the aspect that don't be in a rush. Make sure that when you apply for the medical school that you're putting your best foot forward, that there's nothing that you have anguish about on your application, that there's nothing that you know that you have admitted, uh, I mean, I've been it. And, and have not fulfilled the obligation for, uh, you know, understand that this is a lifetime of learning. Medicine is not just something you learn, I got it, bang, I go on to something else. Most people who become physicians go into it because they enjoy the lifetime of learning that occurs. The other aspect of it is, is understanding that being a physician it's being a servant. You're a servant to the people that come to you in their most vulnerable position. And it's in that vulnerable position that you must not only understand their illness, but how their illness impacts their families, how that illness impacts their psyche. You must be able to treat that patient as a whole and not as a disease. I hate it when I hear people talk about I saw a diabetic today, as opposed to saying, I saw a person who was living with diabetes. It's about the person, not the disease state, that we're trying to treat as physicians. Um, at the same time, though, you must also understand that not only do you have a lifetime of learning, lifetime of being a servant, but you also have a lifetime of being a leader. Because 
when you obtain that letters behind your name, you automatically are in a position higher than 98% of the rest of the population. Because that's where you are, the top 2%. And in that role, people look up to you, whether you want them to or not. And it's your responsibility that I've learned from my, my mentors like Dr. Charles Johnson, like Dr. Uh, Dale Wigfall here, uh, Michael, Michael Padre right here, they have all taught me to understand the value that I have with that MD behind my name and to use it for the good of not only my, my people, but for my community, not even my state, and even my nation. So, you know, you have to be willing to be able to give up yourself because it will be demanded of you. And if it's not, then that means that people do not respect you. So that would be my, my two minutes for um, I think Cedric has said a lot of the things that I feel very strongly about. Um, and one of the opportunities being Dean of Admissions has given me is to say over and over to people the things that I heard from the people who expect us to serve. One of the smartest things that I could have done was to ask them who should go to medical school. And it wasn't just the community, it was the faculty, it was the administration, it was everybody. I was pleasantly surprised that they said it in different ways, but they said the same thing. And I'm always, I always hear the people who said to me, I don't want to go doctor. I don't, I don't want to go doctor. Go out and find the smartest people you can. And because I want them to take care of me because they, they have to be smarter than you all are because they will be asking the questions of why the things you thought you could do really kind of work. So I don't want to go doctor. And if you, if you are choosing medicine because you want to give back to a community of people, no matter where they come from or what they look like, if you give them power over their lives. One lady, when I asked, told me that the thing that she regrets about some of the people who are in medicine is that they don't make the connection between dignity and control. When she was sick, she lost the control of her life. And she didn't feel like voting. She didn't feel like going to children's PTA meetings. She just didn't have any control of her life. And she realized that the thing she prized the most was her dignity had been compromised by her health. And so she needed a voice. And she wanted her doctor to be her voice. But she reminded her doctor that she wanted her voice back and therefore she wanted the dignity back. And so she wanted someone smart enough to be able to help her get that back. And she reminded me of something we forget is that medicine is a two-way street. It's a partnership. That's correct. That people allow you into their lives. No gift is greater than that. That someone will trust you enough to let you into their lives and then to tell you to get out when you have done your work so they can go about things. Mm -hmm. And so the process of getting to medical school is a journey that all of us take to um, give back to people their dignity, to give back to people their control. Then go out and go. One lady that I was taking care of recently, I was taking care of her child, but she was sick. I knew she was sick. And this was before the election. And so she, I had my little, I voted. And on the day of the election, she said, if somebody has picked me in the ambulance, I'm going to vote for my president for today. Mm -hmm. 
And even though everybody thinks it, it, it's just one vote, I know that my vote will count. And she said, can you imagine that I'm sick and I still want to vote? And I said, no, ma'am. I would be surprised that you wouldn't do everything to vote because you know this woman is 70 years old. You, you, you knew what it was like not to have a vote. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. So as physicians, we have to be deliberate. We have to show that deliberation or that deliberateness in the process of trying to get to be a physician. And the choices we make to grow us up and the fact that we have to remember that we are standing on the shoulders of people who made incredible, incredible sacrifices for us. And our children who have not learned their history need to go back and learn it so that they will have that deliberateness about them because they're giving back to the people who are nameless to them, but who gave them that chance. And it was the expectation that we would take that chance and we would parlay that into brilliance. And then we would take that brilliance and the humanity that our people have delivered to us through generations. We would take that brilliance and the humanity that we have innately it comes with the hue and then we would provide a measure of relief from sickness and protection and prevention from sickness to the people who have gone without it for so long that lady said, I want a smart doctor. And anybody who is preparing for medicine needs to keep that in mind. I want a smart doctor. I want a doctor who understands that respect and dignity are never negotiable. Mm -hmm. I want the control of my life back because that's where my dignity is. And confidentiality. That's right. oh, Especially in this age of phones, phone, tweets. tweets, and all yeah, that, yeah. we must. I would really remind the, your students, uh, the students of, uh, that are, are viewing the that diversity, diversity in medicine, that you know, technology has its place, but technology will never replace the human touch. It will never replace the human story, and it can never. That holds the human seat. That's right. Which means. But that's who the democratic oh. That's exactly it. That which has been given to you as information is never divulged. Never. never. That confidentiality is a cardinal piece of the Hippocratic Oath. So one of the, I asked one of the students one time, what does the Hippocratic Oath mean to you? They had to read it. And he said, do good. It is that it's wonderful language, but it is to good. And that's what it is. Thank you all for coming. So um, we'll have another video up next month. We really appreciate the two of you taking the time out. Hopefully it's going to help our viewers get prepared for the application process this year. Hopefully we'll have it up next year so they can watch it all, all the time. <laughs> um, another video next month www.diversemedicine.org join the website mentor we need more mentors we're having you know a lot of pre-med students join the website looking for mentors so we need people to actually step up to the plate and help these the next generation come up thank you dr bright thank you sir yeah. thank you you're welcome next time